Welcome to Living Word, growing a family that experiences every promise of God. You're listening to another life-changing word from Pastor Jason Anderson. For more information, visit our website at livingwordonline.com. Father God, I thank you for this time. Ask, Lord, that you'd bless this time, that you open up our hearts to receive your word, your bread, its wisdom in our lives. It's also seed in our hearts, and it produces change in us. Holy Spirit, be our teacher. Teach us what we need to know today. Prepare us for what is coming in our lives. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Well, this morning I want to talk to you about today uh, God's canopy of protection over your life. Isaiah chapter 4 and verse 5. It's one of my favorite scriptures in the Word of God. It says this, Then the Lord will create over all of Mount Zion and over those who assemble there. Say assemble. Yeah, or type it. So those who assemble. And, and today we're assembling, albeit through creative technology, we're uniting under this word to hear what God has to say for us. And as part of the assembly, God is about to promise something in your life. You know, the promises of God are yes, and they are amen. They are free. They are part of the glory that surrounds you right now. And I want you to know that as a gift, they're available to you. And this is for those who are in the assembly. That's you. So what we're about to see is something that's promised to you. But if you don't know something's promised to you, you may not be living in it fully. So let's look at it. It's over all of Mount Zion and over those who assemble there. Mount Zion is the church of the living God. There's going to be a cloud of smoke by day and a glow of flaming fire by night. Now, the cloud by day and the fire by night was what the Israelites were led by through the wilderness to the promised land. So God is moving us from where we are to somewhere better, even though we're under a canopy and it looks like we're staying on the mountain. Those who are planted are actually on the move. That's what he's saying. And he's saying this, and it will be a shelter and a shade from the heat of the day and a refuge and a hiding place from the storm and the rain. This Mount Zion, this assembling together, that you're here today, the promise is God is a canopy of glory all around you, all around your family. You are not vulnerable. You are not exposed. Your God has not left you without defense. But his house is the refuge. It's the mighty high tower. It is the shelter from the storm. Wednesday, there was a massive storm uh, here in Arizona, right outside my it was afternoon, and it was right outside my back window. Me and my family were standing there, and all of a sudden, it just started to come down. I, I tell you what, it was one of, the, one of the biggest rainstorms I've seen. Even though it only lasted a few minutes, it was just pouring. It looked like it was going to hail. And as I was looking out there, and the wind was blowing, and my trees, my, I got some, uh, uh, cit- some citrus trees and stuff up there. As they're blowing around, I thought to myself, you know what? I'm not getting wet. I don't, the wind isn't even blowing through my one or two hairs. It's completely calm where I am while the storm is raging on out there. And I thought about the shelter of God's house, that in the middle of all this storm, here we are completely protected. This is God's promise for you right now. You look at the news, you look at the problems, you talk to people, and you would feel like the world was falling apart. But if you look at your God, you'll find out there's a different result for his people. And we have to stand firmly in that faith, understanding this promise that God has a canopy of his glory all around me. And if, you, if I were to look out that window and see my son Logan, 12 years old, running around the backyard, let's say he was just running around looking for shelter. He wasn't out there, but if he were getting wet, getting blown around, I don't have a lot of cover in my backyard for, for shelter from the rain. What would I do? I, w- I wouldn't lock the sliding glass door and laugh, would I? I would open the door, oh, I might. I would open the door and slide it open, and I would say, Logan, come in. Come in here. Come, get out of the rain and come in here. Why? Because I know where the shelter is. See, church, now is our time. We were built for moments like this. When the whole world is getting wet and caught in the storm, 
We are the ones who call out from the shelter of the Most High and say, we have an answer for you if you'll just come in from the rain, if you'll just get in here from the storm. You see, now is the moment when things get darkest that the light has got to get up to its high place and boldly pronounce, Jesus is still on the throne in this place. Amen? Amen. This is our moment, church. And here's the problem. The whole world right now is looking at all of what's happening, and they're kind of don't have an answer. You know, we don't have an answer because in the world, we've spent a lot of time pushing God out of our lives. The world has spent a lot of time all around the world saying, God, we don't know if we believe in you, and even if we do believe in you, we're not sure that we need you. When you do that, suddenly you have other things you have to rely on when you don't feel safe. When you don't feel safe, suddenly you've got to rely on your money. In this country, we have trillions of dollars. But notice that no amount of money is seeming to be able to solve this problem. We have the smartest scientists, most medical advances, anointed doctors, and yet, in this particular instance, nobody's offering any kind of cure. When you run out of answers, what are you going to do? Who will you turn to? When there is no other answer, who are you going to call? You can't even call the Ghostbusters right now. They've retired. Right? What happened? How did the world get to this place? You know, don't you remember we built this city? We built this city on rock and roll. We built this city. Right? Party! We built this city on rock and roll. Yeah, you know what? When you build something on rock and roll, it seems like a lot of fun for a while. But when everything starts to fall apart, suddenly you can't lean on your rock and roll to get healed. You can't lean on your rock and roll in times of financial calamity. You can't go to your rock and roll when you, when you have a famine in the land. You can't build this city any longer on rock and roll. You can't build this city any longer on greed or the lusts or the pleasures of this world. You have got to, you cannot build this city on fear and panic. And what are we going to do? We have to build this city on the word of God. We have to learn to turn to the Lord in times of trouble. Can I get an amen from your living room? (laughs) When David was serving as uh, an armor bearer for King Saul, he was living in the palace. He'd been anointed to be king, but he wasn't yet. He defeated Goliath. He was married to the king's daughter. He became one of the generals in the army for King Saul. And he was getting so famous for all the victories that he had with the armies. And he was getting so loved by the people that all of a sudden King Saul got jealous of him decided he was going to kill David. David had to flee the palace. He lost all his friends. He lost his family. He lost his wife. He's running for his life. You know where he went first when things fell apart? When his life suddenly hit a massive storm? Do you know where he ran first? The Bible says he went to Nob and he went to the priest there. He ran first to God's house, the first place David knew to look. Now, Nob means high place. He went to the house of God, which at that time was situated on a hill. And he writes this in Psalms in chapter 121 and verse 1. I look to the high place in times of trouble. He said, from whence does my help come? He knew where to go first. You think if he's being hunted by the king, he might have just run for the the forest or run for hid somewhere, went somewhere. Why first to God's house? Because David knew where his help would come from. He said this, Who do I turn to when I need help? For my help comes from the Lord. He knew where to go first. He went to the shelter. He went to the canopy. And there he received bread. Not just any bread, too. You know, he asked for regular bread, but the priest said, We don't have any. All we have is the holy bread. And he gave gave to David the holy bread. Five loaves. It's a picture of grace that God was going to cover David in this tough time. And that holy bread reminds us of the Lord's wisdom, right? That holy bread tells us Jesus, who said, I'm the bread of life. Man does not live by, in, by words alone or 
by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus said, my, my words are spirit and they are life. It was the holy bread. The wisdom of God is what he needed in this moment. And so also today, you have come to the right place. You could be binge watching Netflix right now, right? You could be watching Hulu. You could be watching the news. There's all kinds of things you could consume right now. And people are kind of locked down. Here in Arizona, they locked everything down on Friday. You can't really go to restaurants or anywhere right now. Everything's kind of, they're trying to tell, you know, just stay at home, right? Just be safe. And while they're locking everything down and we don't know where to turn to, we can turn to the living God. And we're not sure what to do because we have all this time on our hands. Like, what are people going to do? I was, I was looking on uh, Twitter and all these uh, young college kids are trying to figure out what to do with all the time that they have right now. <laughs> And I, I, I saw one video, it really made me laugh. They said, day six of being quarantined to my dorm. And then this is the, the video that I found. <laughs> this is what they're doing with their time. And you know what? I'm okay with you watching some Netflix and watching some Hulu and finding ways to get a smile on your face. But I tell you what. The most important thing you could be doing is eating the word of God, that holy bread. You came to the right place today, and you're getting that wisdom of God. I went hiking with my family just this Friday, last Friday, and I was, I was really impressed to see all the families that are out there. I'll tell you, it was the busiest I've ever seen. We went to the hieroglyphics here in Arizona, and as we got up there, we saw the waters beautiful, a lot of people there. We're sitting on a rock, and I started eating a sandwich. My son, Logan, he's 12, he looked up, and kind of this face of the mountain here, pretty high up, there was a little plateau that you could get to. And he said, Dad, I'd like to climb up there. Well, I was kind of like, I'm eating a sandwich right now. I'm not sure that I want to do that, but I was like, okay, you can climb up there. He's like, can you come with me? I, well, I was already planning. I was definitely going to go. I was not going to leave him nor forsake him as he tried to climb this very steep uh, wall of mountain. You know what I didn't do? I didn't say, all right, here's what you do. Go around this rock, up that path, up there, hang a right, go up that rock, and then see that little thing. And then I didn't do that. Instead, I just stood right next to him as he began the climb, and I would say, now don't put your foot there. That's going to fall. You could look at that wobbly rock. Now don't do that. Now put your hand right here. Now take a look. Now, don't go around this way. I want you to go around this way. And I began to monitor every single step that he took as he climbed something that was quite precarious. We got all the way up to the top. It took many little steps. But before you knew it, we were on that precipice. We were on that plateau at the top. And we were high above everything else and everyone else. There was no one else up there. And looking down upon all that God had done in this, in this, really, it was his father, right, taking him up there. But I want you to know it's the same thing for you and I. This is what God wants to do in your life. He wants to give you little bits of wisdom right now. Maybe you're a business owner and you're looking at, hey, I just had to close down. I just had to lay off all these employees. I don't know what I'm going to do. How am I going to make rent? Listen, don't be afraid. But instead, go to the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit is going to give you small steps to take. He's going to say, hey, try emailing this guy. Have you called this person in a little while? I want you to step right here. Do this little bit thing. Maybe there's a business that you've been thinking about starting, and God's going to say to you, I want you to start this. Maybe there's a dream that you let go of that now you have the time to pay some attention to. God's going to give you little bits of wisdom to get exactly where he wants you to go. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's those little steps. Maybe you just got laid off. Listen, you are not vulnerable. You are not exposed. Do not be afraid. God has not left you alone. He is not surprised that you went through this layoff. He saw it happening long ago. He's already gone ahead of you to prepare a way. You are under the canopy of his glory. Jesus is not checking the stock market right now to see if he's allowed to bless you. God is not checking with the CDC right now to see if he's allowed to heal you. God is already all over this thing. Your job is to look to the Word of God, to stay in the assembly, to be planted. Your job is to stay in faith and stand on that what God is saying is true in your life. Don't fall into the trap of fear. Don't fall into the trap of discouragement and hopelessness. But know that God is protecting you. The other thing that David found when he was there was the sword of Goliath. It was a victory that he had had before. God wants to do two things for you today. He wants to show you his wisdom, but he also wants to show you his strength.
that sword. We need the sword and the strength to remember past victories. In the time of Sharmageddon, right? When toilet paper as we know it has changed forever, we'll never look at it the same way again. I, even when they finally stock the shelves with toilet paper, you'll probably grab a little extra, won't you? In the time of Sharmageddon, we need a sword. Let me give you your sword right now. The sword that you came for. Psalm chapter 37 and verse 19. In times of disaster, they will not wither. In days of famine, they will enjoy plenty. It might be a famine, but here's what's going to happen. David recognized this. He said, you know what? What everyone else is getting in this life, I seem to be getting something different. I seem to be obsolete and exempt from what's happening in the storms of this world. He began to recognize that when it's famine, for some reason, I get to enjoy plenty. We need to have this same mindset. When I was a young father and my wife was pregnant with Katie, she's 21 years old now. When she went into labor, they gave her some morphine towards the end of labor. They thought it would be several more hours before she would give birth, but it was a mistake. And that morphine was still in her when she gave birth to Katie. And the danger there was, is that the baby may not breathe on their own. When she came out, she made a little noise. I had the video camera out there as a father. I was videotaping the whole thing. And, and, uh, and then I followed the doctor over, and, and, and I'm watching, and I noticed him calling nurses in. Nurses began to come in, and he had a, a breathing thing over her, her nose and her mouth. And, and I, I, as I was videotaping, I got very confused, and, I remember Christian being born, and I didn't see any of this happening. And I said, what are you doing to her? And, and the, the doctor looked over at me, and he said, your daughter's not breathing. And as I looked at her, I realized she was blue, and she was lifeless. She wasn't moving. I ran over to Kelly. It had been maybe over a minute. It went so fast. And I grabbed Kelly's hand, and she said, what, what? What's wrong? I said, our baby's not breathing. And I said, let's pray. In the name of Jesus, I didn't, I didn't know what to pray. Can I just say that? I didn't know. I didn't have some real cool, ornate prayer. I didn't go to the God of the Alpha and Omega and the B. I didn't have time. I just, I, was, I just cried out to the Lord. I cried out in the name of Jesus, breathe. And immediately at that moment, right when I said Jesus' name, what happened? She began to cry. 21 years later, here she is singing on the stage. You might be listening to the story and you're like, Pastor, I've heard you tell that story a lot of times. I know I'm still carrying my sword of Goliath. I won't put it down. I will use this story to beat back on the kingdom of darkness every chance I get. And sometimes I just remind myself of what God did in my life. I'm not putting that sword away ever in my whole lifetime. That's my sword of Goliath. It's the reminder of the great victory that God had in my life. Jesus talked about this. He said in John chapter 3 and verse 14, that the Son of Man will be like the pole, the snake that Moses lifted up. Let's go there now. John chapter 3 and verse 14. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. He was talking about the moment that he would be on the cross, and he equated it to a moment when Moses lifted up a snake that he had put on a stick. I'll tell you the story right now. Some of you are like, what? I know a snake on a stick, it sounds like something you'd eat at the Renaissance Festival, right? Instead, there was a great plague broke out to the, in the Israelites. They were in the wilderness on their way to the promised land. And God said to Moses, put a snake on a pole and lift it up. And anyone who looked at that snake on that pole, they got healed. The Bible doesn't say that they changed their behavior, that, that it was something about anything other than where they turned their gaze. They were dying, but when they looked at that pole. How is that snake on a pole a picture of Christ in the cross? Because when Jesus was on the cross, he became sin for us in that moment. He who knew no sin became sin. He was a picture. He was becoming that serpent on that cross. Why? Because he was destroying the power of sin over your life. He was destroying the power of bad decisions and bad behaviors. He was destroying the power of unforgiveness. He was destroying the power of poverty. And he was destroying the power of sickness. He was destroying every evil work of that snake. 
He was like showing us that when we turn our gaze to the finished work that he did on that cross, that we can receive freely whatever he's provided. The problem often is what we're looking at, right? When we're looking at the wrong thing, maybe we're looking at the plague. And those Israelites could have been looking at each other, man, you're sick, I'm sick, we're all sick. But somebody got healed. And you look at them and you say, well, how'd you get healed? And the person who got healed was like, well, I just looked over there at that, that pole with the snake on it. You should look there too. You see, when you get the answer, it's so important that now you become the answer. When I got the answer of that victory of Katie in my, in my life and watching Jesus bring her back, now I use that victory every chance I get. And I point people, when you don't have anywhere else to turn to, when you're not sure what you're going to do, when you've exhausted the doctors and the medicine and we love them, when you've exhausted the government and we support them and pray for them, when you've exhausted every resource and there's still no answer, just know this, when I didn't when I didn't know what to do and the doctors couldn't revive my daughter, I could still look to my God. I could still turn to the name of Jesus. I was not without help and I was not without hope. It's the same thing for you and I today. What are you going through? If you'll just stop looking at the problem, stop looking at the news, stop looking at the circumstance, don't look at the plague. Don't look at the famine. Don't look at, don't get your eyes fixed on the stock market, but get your eyes fixed on the cross. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. He is the author and he is the perfecter of your faith. This is going to change your entire outlook in life. What are we doing? We're learning how to stand on that promise of God. And we need to be doing that in this time. And when we do, we take that sword of Goliath in our lives. We tell the rest of the world, hey, I got healed. Look at the cross. When you have the answer, it becomes a responsibility to become the answer. Exodus chapter 30, 23 and verse 25 says this, and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. Sometimes we need to gain perspective. Remember, that's really what I'm talking about, isn't it? They had to change their perspective and look at the cross. David changed his perspective and went to the house of God. Sometimes it's just a perspective change can make all the difference in your world. You were looking over here, suddenly you're looking at the right thing. I called my mom to gain perspective. I've learned in my life that the older I get, the more perspective you get at what's happening now in your life because you have experiences to draw from. When I was a young man, I remember in the junior high, I was like in sixth grade or seventh grade, there was a girl that I had a crush on. I thought she was everything. And so I made, with bold confidence, I made my move with this girl. I made one of those notes with the boxes that you write. If you like Jason Anderson, check yes or check no. I gave it to my friend and he promptly delivered it to her. When he brought it back to me, it, she had checked the box no. I don't like him. I remember my world stopped that day. I just thought it was the worst thing that could ever happen. This was the worst day of my life. A girl in the seventh grade not liking me. I can tell you now, being a little bit older, that I've gained perspective about what can happen to us in our lives. So I called my mom and my dad. I called my dad first to kind of get perspective. Dad's been around a lot longer than I have. And so I reached out to him. I said, Dad, can you tell me, is this really bad, what we're going through right now? Is this the, is this the biggest one you've ever seen? You know what my dad's first response was? He laughed for about 15 seconds. He just started laughing out loud. I had to pull the phone away. He's just chuckling. It reminded me of this meme that I saw. Jesus beats the coronavirus 1v1. Put it up there. Where is it? He's the greatest meme ever. Yeah, there he is. Jesus beats coronavirus 1v1. He does, doesn't he? And I don't mean to make light of the situation. I do think it's inappropriate to make a bunch of jokes about the Budweiser virus, but that's just part of my self-defense mechanism is to make jokes about these things. You know, my dad showed me something in that moment, perspective, to recognize that worse things probably have happened in different generations. And as this generation faces this event, this is a time and a challenge for us to step up to the plate to grow and get strong and to get bold with our Jesus and with our cross and what we know. I got my mom on the phone. I was going to ask her the same question. I was like, hey, mom, I just wanted to ask you. She said, before you do, can I tell you something? I said, sure. You know what she did? She started to tell me the story about how God had healed her from rheumatoid arthritis. She said, you know, when I was 45 years old, the doctor, I woke up one morning and I couldn't move. 
Your dad carried me to the car, we went to the doctor, and after a series of tests, they found out, I got the phone call, you have rheumatoid arthritis. It is a very aggressive form of it. It is untreatable at this time. You know, my mom stayed and prayed. She, she says it this way. She said, I prayed and persisted, Jason. I prayed and I persisted. She said, like Daniel, who prayed and 21 days later was still praying, the angel of the Lord showed up and said, I was released to you the moment you began praying, but it took me 21 days to bring you the answer. In the same way, she prayed and persisted. She never gave up. And you know what? God healed her. Today, she walks around. She's preaching. She's just fine. And she wanted to tell me that story right when I got on the phone with her. First, before I even asked her a question, this was on her mind. And here's my point. My mom is pre-programmed that when things are crazy, when it looks like calamity is happening, when the storm is raging outside, her brain immediately goes to the sword of Goliath. She goes to the victory when she had a tough time, but God brought her out of it. And she was meditating on this so much so that the first thing out of her mouth when I called her was the victory God had already provided for her. This needs to be our thinking. What has God already brought us through? What kind of things have you already seen? Has God been a victory in your life? Was there a time when it was impossible, but boom, he came through with a mighty victory? You pick up your sword of Goliath at God's house today, and you walk around this earth showing people. And I love how it was the first thing on her mind, because when you have the answer, it's so important that now we can become the answer. We may be seeing the plague around us, but we're pointing to that snake on the stick. We're pointing to our Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't look like there's an answer, but we're calling people into the canopy of his glory and the shade from the heat of the day. Somebody's say amen. I was on a really small plane coming back from Alabama last week. Now, this whole thing blew up so fast. When we went out to, to Florida, which was why we were flying back from Alabama, uh, there, everything was calm. Everything was fine when we went. But while we were there, it, the whole thing blew up all over the news, and suddenly they're shutting everything down, and things got crazy. And I got on that plane after fill in my brain and my mind with coronavirus is everywhere. It's a pandemic and it's so bad. And you know, I got on this little plane from Mobile, Alabama to Houston as we were trying to make our way home. And this plane was so small. I can't even tell you. It was, it was this little tiny commuter plane. Have you ever seen those really small ones you get on? It's not the normal size one. And you're already kind of like, well, this is a small plane. But then when there's coronavirus in the plane, like in your mind, right? you understand, you're like, okay. And I was with like 60 people in an airplane roughly the size of a Volkswagen van. That's how it felt, right? And I was just like, and you're getting on the plane. You don't want to touch anything. Have you ever had a meltdown? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? When, when things just, I'm a, I'm a strong man of faith, but in this moment, my flesh just saw coronavirus. I mean, he's got corona. I bet you got coronavirus. I bet you have coronavirus. Look at that. You're just wiping your nose. And you hear a cough behind you. You're like, cuckoo. And you're like, that dude's got coronavirus. And I just sit in my chair, my whole family, and we're wiping everything down with antibacterial things. And I'm just sitting there. And, I'm, and, and all of a sudden, I got to go to the bathroom. And I was like, no. No, I'm not going to the bathroom on this plane. Right? Going to a bathroom, and I felt like it would be like jumping in a vat of respiratory droplets. Know what I'm saying? But I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I held on as long as I could, but I was like, I gotta go to the bathroom. So I, I make my way past everybody and I go down to the, all the way to the back of the plane. I don't wanna touch the, anything and I'm kinda pushing it with my elbow, trying to get the door open. And I open the door and in the bathroom, you know, the, uh, the, the, there's like a sink thing and, and the, there's like a cabinet here. For some reason it was open. Like, and you could see all the stuff in the, and it looked like the bathroom was closed. And so I looked and there was the flight attendant right there because you know the bathroom's in the back. And she looked at me funny and I go like this and she goes, well, go on in. And I was like, well, it looks like it's closed. And she goes, oh, that's just the cabinet door. Just put your hand on it and shove it real, put my hand on it? Are you kidding? That thing is dripping with the coronavirus, right? I use my foot to try and close. What's my point? Sometimes we have meltdowns. You know that David had a meltdown in Psalm chapter 6. There's many psalms where David had meltdowns. When you have a meltdown, that doesn't make you a person of low faith. It doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't mean you've opted out of your miracle. So often we might hear that, well, if you got discouraged, you got hopeless, now God can't move in your life. Listen, David, 
He had lots of meltdowns in the Psalms. He had times of weakness. In Psalm chapter 6, he's like, I don't know where God is. Everything's bad. My life's falling apart. My, my enemies are rejoicing over me. The whole world's falling. I, what am I going to do? But then all of a sudden he goes, but, but you know, God, you are good to me. And your mercy endures for And then he starts to talk to himself. He's like, but God, you were there before. You know, you helped me before. And before you know it, he turned things around. I want you to know that if you've had a meltdown this week, and I know some of you have, if you've had a meltdown, it's okay. The important part is that you begin to turn it around in your thoughts. Okay, it's bad, but you know what? God, you're good. You're good to me. I'm hearing the wisdom of God and the sword of Goliath today. In other words, I'm hearing wisdom and I'm hearing power today. I've gathered in the assembly and I found out today there's a canopy of protection over my life. Let me pray for all of you right now in the name of Jesus, Father God, that we are standing here at this assembly and that we partake of, we, we receive now your canopy of glory, a protection over our lives. Lord, that we are not vulnerable, we are not afraid, we are not exposed, we are not alone, but you are with us, you have gone before us, you follow behind us, and you are leading us every step of the way. No sickness can touch this household, no sickness can touch our homes, no plague can come near us. You have removed sickness and disease from the midst of us. It cannot even even come into our city, into our neighborhood, into our state. Coronavirus and every plague that is trying to attack us, get out in the name of Jesus. Now just receive it. Just receive it. Praise God. You know, in Georgia, they were kind of late in the game this last week to closing schools and closing churches. And they were highly criticized there for a bit by the press. I looked into it and I found out it was because the state legislature had not given the governor the power he needed to close those things. They had an emergency meeting this last Monday and they gave him, granted him the power to do what they wanted him to do to make people feel safe. And here's my point. Whatever we look to for our safety, we will give power to in order to feel safe. I've got a surprise for you. In Matthew in chapter 10, the Bible says that Jesus called his disciples to him. And when he had gathered them to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out. He gave them power to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. And so I want to leave you with this final thought. You already have within you the power. You see, you're a disciple of Jesus Christ. And his giving of that authority, his words are living and active. Heaven and earth may pass away, but his words will never pass away. When you became his disciple, this word got spoken and living and active into your life. You have the power to turn around a hurricane. You have the power to rebuke all kinds of sicknesses and diseases out of your household, out of, your, out of bodies of people around you, out of your neighborhood out of your city and church this is our moment this is our time he left us with not only the responsibility but our father god left us not only with the shield of protection and his word and his promise he left us not only with the glory the tangible manifestation about to happen in your life but he left us with the authority that we might speak the word of god and see a difference in our lives that no calamity or famine will overtake us but in this church among this assembly we will enjoy plenty in the time of famine and if you receive it say i believe it in jesus name well thanks so much for tuning in today and don't forget about our daily bible study you can just go to youtube and type in daily bible study and find us I'm doing morning scripture we pray every day but right now we want to say a prayer with you uh, if there's anyone that's watching this that's never received Jesus and you're not sure what eternity looks like for you if you were to face eternity, you can have that secured right now because the good news is God gave his one and only son as a free gift for your salvation. You just put your faith in him. So repeat this prayer after me. Dear Father God, I ask you to forgive me of my sin. And Jesus, I believe in you. 
I believe you're the Son of God who died for sin and rose from the dead. Be my Lord and baptize me in your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer, find a church, find something close, and get in church, be there every single week. We need to be under a new message and we need to be around some new people. God bless you.